Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the ability to freely gather together in this building to sing songs of worship to you. I ask that you would be with us as we step into our time of communion. Remind us of the great gift of salvation purchased by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Amen. Welcome to our time of communion. This is a time for believers in Jesus Christ. We do this in obedience to Jesus' command in the Last Supper. Uh, we eat a small wafer of bread and we drink a small thimble full of juice uh, while we remember uh, the salvation that was purchased by the blood of Christ on the cross for our sins. And again, it is a time for believers in Jesus Christ. If you would say that you're here this morning and that isn't your profession, you're not trusting in Christ, I'm thanking the Lord that you're here this morning. Um, Listen to the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel will be presented this morning. Tune your ears to listen to this good message of grace for you. But in regard to communion, since it is for believers and a reflection of Jesus Christ remembering back on his sacrifice, I would ask that as the elements come that you would let them pass by. Now, if you need a Bible this morning, I believe we've got some young men here that would love to pass the Bible out and put it in your hands if you need one. Uh, we're going to be finding ourselves... Uh, in John chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. And we're going to be looking at a lesser promise that points to a greater promise. And hopefully we can do that in about seven minutes. So in John 3, 14 through 15, most of us are familiar with this passage. Jesus is sitting down with Nicodemus. Having a private conversation in the middle of the night, Jesus is telling Nicodemus who he truly is and why he has ultimately come to the earth. And it says this in John 3, verses 14 through 15. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. We find Jesus telling Nicodemus something amazing. Jesus must be lifted up for a particular purpose that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, before we go any further, it would be wise of us to go back and look at this account. Jesus is attaching a picture of something or himself to a picture in the Old Testament. And so let's go look at that. That's in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. Israel's been in the wilderness for some time. At this point, Miriam and Aaron have died, and the people of Israel have continued to rebel against God even though he has only continued to provide for them and show them mercy. Numbers 21, 4 through 9 says this. From Mount Hor they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there was no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. You know what we see here? We see a couple things. We see a rebellious people who belong to a gracious, patient God. Rather than just killing them all uh, for their lack of love for him and anger against him, he provides a means to save them from death. Another thing we see is an object that points to God's promise. The bronze serpent had no power in itself. It was a piece of metal. But God used that bronze serpent as a visible means for the Israelites to exercise faith in the Lord that he would heal them. We also see Israelites exercising faith in that promise. It says in verse 9, he would look at the bronze serpent 
and live. Now let's turn back to John 3, 14 through 15. Now hold that image in your mind and think about it in the context of Jesus' statement with Nicodemus. Imagine being Nicodemus, a man who would have known the account of the bronze serpent from early childhood. He's grasping the picture of the bronze serpent that Jesus is now applying to himself, and he must have been thinking, how is Jesus going to be lifted up, and how is he going to give people eternal life? He's a rabbi. Thankfully, unlike Nicodemus, we can sit on the backside of the cross and see with crystal clarity Jesus' statement. Just like the bronze serpent, Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross for all to see, but the extent of his work on the cross far exceeds the effect of the bronze serpent. The bronze serpent was an event that pointed to a promise. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross was an event that pointed to a greater promise. The bronze serpent only prevented death for those who believed. Jesus Christ's sacrifice purchased eternal life for all those who believe. The bronze serpent's effect was isolated to a particular time and a particular people. The effect of Jesus Christ's work on the cross extended to every nation, every tribe, and even today, it continues to save. God used the bronze serpent to give mercy, not giving the Israelites the consequence that they deserved. God demonstrated his grace to rebellious sinners through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus paid for the consequence of our sin on the cross and suffered under God's wrath on our behalf, on my behalf. The promise God made in the bronze serpent pales in comparison to the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And this promise that God has made to all who believe in his son stands to this day. For those of us who have believed in this promise, we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and do not believe, hear the grace of God extended towards you. God has provided a means for you to know him forever and to have eternal life. There's a day coming where wrath and judgment from God will come to this earth against sin. Um, Better to have eternal life and to know Christ now than to come into judgment later. Communion points us to the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And the cross should point us to this promise. Jesus Christ paid for the consequence of our sin, suffered under God's wrath on our behalf, and he has purchased eternal life for us. Please take time to reflect on our great Savior, the sin he purchased on your behalf as we step into communion. And I'll ask the men to come forward. You can please reflect and then take communion on your own.